Christ the living word, and uh, both of them have been given to us, and we thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, turn to Psalm chapter 68, verse 11. Psalm chapter 68, verse 11. And as I said before, the church, the body of Christ, has been woefully ignorant about the issue of preservation. They've been deceived uh, concerning the word of God and that began very early in your Bible in Genesis chapter 3 when, when Satan began, the serpent began to talk to Eve and said, Yea, hath God said. And before he barely got that out of his mouth, she's already adding to it, taking it away, and confusing things. You see, she was deceived on that issue. Adam comes along and he made a decision that was a conscious willful choice to believe the word of Satan rather than to believe the word of God. And you can thank him for your sin nature. And as you raise your children, you'll find out that when you raise children, you're going to find this out if you haven't already, you know, if your children aren't old enough yet. But uh, my advice to you as one parent to another is get the Holy Spirit in those children as quickly as you can because the Holy Spirit will work in children. We just spent a week with the kids at camp at our uh, at Florida Youth Grace Camp, and uh, we're really excited about the way the camp's been going and kids are getting saved and kids are getting edified. I had a young lady wrote me a letter uh, from, about the camp and how much fun she had, and she comes from a really tough situation in her personal life. She's like 13 years old, and and boy, she really enjoyed the messages. And when, when I was there teaching, we're doing Q&A, we're teaching, we're dealing with these children, uh, both in the youth and mainly the teens this year. It was uh, exciting to see them all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed with their Bibles open, sitting on the front row, ready to go, taking notes. I had a, a young girl, she's still there every year now. She sat with a, with a big old notebook and, and made a copy of that chart <laughs> over a four-day period. And I looked at that, I said, wow, you're a good artist. And then I handed her one of the charts already printed, and her eyes went, woo this was great. You know, it's, loved, it's, it's great to see that, and, and they get to see the Word of God from 30,000 feet and really get the bird's eye view. You get, a, you get the idea that there's a plan here, don't you? And that everything God does, he does with a plan. And so Satan's plan of corruption is to make sure that you don't know where the Word of God can be found or that you question it when you do think you have it. And we shouldn't do that. Psalm 68, 11, it says, The Lord gave the word, and great is the company of those that publish it. And the word publish there does not mean just print it. It means to talk about it in public everywhere you go. Publish it everywhere. Publish it. And that's a great thing to do. The word of God is meant to be disseminated. It's meant to go out. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, turn over there with me, and you'll see how this deception tries to stop you from going out. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I believe this is probably the first instance of this actually happening in Genesis 3 we're talking about. And Paul here is warning us about this in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13. He says uh, about these false teachers, he says, for... Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. He says, uh, as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So back there in Genesis 3, you really have that first kind of sermon of that transformation into that angel of light. He wasn't a hideous creature trying to convince Eve. He was, he was something else. And he transforms himself into those things. And of course, now it, it, it's, it, we see it. And Paul, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and Paul say, sees a distinct warning. Uh, Charles Baker said one time that the issue at the judgment seat of Christ for believers in the body of Christ is you're either Pauline or you're not Pauline. He kind of boiled it down. I like that. 
Uh, that impressed me at a young age. You're either with Paul or you're not with Paul. Well, Paul wants you to be with him on this issue. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, we are not, he says, as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. For we are not as many. So if you're using a modern corrupted Bible today, you're not following Paul and you're not with him. There's two sides to this. There's the side of God, the Holy Spirit. There's the side of the satanic policy of evil. You have to make your choice. And so this idea of thinking that, well, all the major things made it through. You know, the salvation issue. I said, well, who determines that? And give me the list, because maybe I missed something. Well, it's, it's inaccurate in uh, historical things and minor things. Well, I don't think jots and tittles are minor. I mean, if you say, let's eat, Grandma, she understands. But if you look at her and go, let's eat, Grandma, <laughs> and don't put the comma there, <laughs> maybe that's pretty important to you. I don't know about you, but... Grandma probably thought it was. We have the Word of God in our hands. And I've always seen in the Bible that, that everybody who has the Bible always has it in their hand. It was never just a reasonable facsimile, and then it's really somewhere else. It's not in the Pope's basement. It, it, it's not in, in some cave somewhere. It, it's been preserved for us. We have the preserved Word of God in the authorized version in English. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on Bible issue, and I can tell you there are a lot of very, very strange <laughs> facts about all this. But I want to say something that might encourage you, even with those around you who are talking about the dilution of the sales of the King James Bible being so low. But when you get, you know, 80, 90, 100, 200 new Bibles in the market, it's going to dilute the market. That's going to happen. But let me tell you something about this, which I think is a very interesting fact that I didn't know myself, and I thought it was great. The amount of Bibles in the world today that exist, that are extant, we would say, if you're talking about manuscripts, something that is existing right now, the amount of Bibles that we have in English, the King James Bible, is way beyond all the others. No matter how many they've been selling, that's how many there are in the last 400 years. So many Bibles of the authorized version, the Holy Bible, exist that it's really going to be tough for people to say, well, I don't, I don't use that because it's, it's just not popular. We're not interested in popularity. We're interested in the Bible that has all the verses. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and I want to say this about this verse, but I want you to, to try to understand that the 13 epistles of St. Paul, that the token of every epistle that he writes is he puts his name on every one of them so you know who's writing it. That's why when you're right, trying to get your doctrine out of Revelation, you can see that John wrote that, and then I can ask you, why are you taking your doctrine from John? Paul puts his autograph on every one of these. But the, 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 the entire idea of the Pauline revelation of truth, the gospel of the grace of God, the mystery of the gospel, Paul calls it, the idea of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the entire consolidation of Paul adding not only his new revelation, but the scriptures of the prophets. And as he says, uh, when he talks about it in Romans 15, he says about that comforting of the scriptures. He talks about those things were, that, were, that were written beforehand, aforehand, for our learning and for our admonition. Paul's the one that gives you the entire complete Bible. But his revelation, his revelation given to him is one of the strongest pieces of evidence in your Bible. 65% of your so-called New Testament is written by one individual man with the greatest message ever given to men or angel. 
Now, if you take this revelation and look at it, you have to ask yourself, why would God inspire the Bible and not intend to preserve the Bible? The whole intention. I mean, do they publish thousands and millions of books and then put them in the warehouse and sit on them? I was in Target the other day picking up some items for the trip, and I walked by, and there's Hillary Clinton, her book, Hard Choices. Yeah. But what I did is I took my camera out and I took a picture of it because it said 30% off because the sales have plummeted in six weeks. Somebody said, that book's a snooze. I couldn't get through the third chapter. They don't print books to sit on them. They print them to get them out. God did not inspire his word without the idea of preserving it completely and totally and perfectly, inerrantly for you and for me. That's the whole idea of preservation. As a matter of fact, the doctrine of inspiration demands the doctrine of preservation be a part of it, but that's the part that is conspicuously missing in all the doctrinal statements. Pick up any doctrinal statement. You can go online and read 10 of them real quick, and they're all the same. It's of plenary authority. It's of full authority. If you're an ambassador extraordinary and a minister plenipotentiary, that means that you have all authority. Turn to Titus chapter 2, and we'll just hold your place there. We're going to come back to 3.16, but look at Titus chapter 2. You know 2 Timothy 2.15. Add Titus 2.15 to that. After everything he teaches you in verse 11 all the way, well, chapter 2 is, <laughs> the whole chapter is fantastic, but in chapter 2, he talks about the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and it's continuing to appear to all men, teaching us, here's what grace teaches us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How do you do that without the Bible? looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might redeem us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. One of the great peculiarities about us as a people is that we, as members of the body of Christ, are a people with a book. And especially grace believers, because we actually begin to understand this issue and it has completely revolutionized and, I believe, really helped the grace movements in this country. People are learning more and more and more. They can trust their Bible. What does that lead to? It, it leads to you believing the Bible. And it effectually works in you when you believe it. So your greatest divine operating asset is not just having the Bible, but it's being able to easily believe it. You know, like children, you, they'll believe anything. You tell them, they'll believe it. And they'll actually believe what you tell them. So what you tell them is very important. And if you tell them early on that Christ died for their sins, they'll get saved and they'll begin to understand the Bible as their final authority in all matters of life and practice and faith and all those things. And as a matter of fact, they can actually begin to learn so that they also, as children, can walk in the Spirit. Can a child be saved? Yes. Can a child walk in the Spirit of God? Can they apply the doctrines of grace? Well, when I opened this letter from this young girl, it was beautifully handwritten on two pages, and she, uh, I had given her a packet with uh, her, the, the four children that came uh, that my brother had brought to camp. I gave him a packet, and it, it had a crunch question sheet in it. And I like to get everybody's written testimony. I collect them from all the kids at camp. And uh, everybody I try to get a hold of, when I talk to them, I want them to hear, write your testimony. And so I get the testimony, and I put it, on, I put it in my file, and I keep it. And I want to I be able to have it. It's handy. It's good to show it to them later, maybe, or it's good to show it to their family when you need to. And she wrote me her testimony. It's a beautiful testimony, and she told me how much she loved camp. And then she came with the Bible questions. Here they go. One, two, three. So my wife said, what are you doing? What are you, you're sitting there doing, you know, doing something. And I, I said, well, I'm writing this, this letter back to her. I'm going to answer these questions. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that when, when somebody 13 years old 
uh, who is going to a Grace Church, by the way, is so excited about the Bible that she'll write you a question and want to know the answer, I'm going to sit down and give her the answer the best I can using the Bible. You know, this whole idea of learning how to live under grace comes from you believing the words on the page in a book, just like you got saved. Notice verse 15. Here's the exhortation to Titus. These things speak, he says, and exhort and rebuke with what? How in the world can you have all authority if you don't have all authority? You have all authority when it's rightly divided because now you understand how it's supposed to go out. Turn back to chapter 3, verse 16, and Paul says all Scripture is given. And uh, as we look at that, we see back there in Psalm 68, the Lord gave the word, and here we see also he gives the word. He says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness. And now here's the practical part, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. How can you perfect a saint with an imperfect book? I don't see how it's possible. It's not possible. This is why Christendom is where they are. And when you look at society today and they're scrambling and groping for answers about why all this violence, why all these, this, this terrible sin, it's because... The King James Bible, the Word of God, is not being utilized in the homes of the American people and has it been since the 50s, and that's the problem. And the chickens have come home to roost, okay? And now the problem is they don't know how to fix it, and they don't know what to do, and even if you gave them the answer, they wouldn't believe it. They're going to try to teach you about gullible warming and evolution before they can do anything else. If you want to talk to some of those people, Take them to the law of Moses and take them to the verse in Exodus 20 where he talks about the Sabbath day. And you ask them, do you believe it's wrong to steal? Do you believe it's wrong to murder? Do you believe it's wrong to do these things? And they'll say, oh, yeah, we believe that. So how about this one? The Lord made the earth in six days. So now you've just taken what you believe and it's okay, and then you've taken what you don't want to believe and you've thrown it out. And they start going through all this stuff about, you know, this is the way the, the creature evolved, and this is the way the plants evolved, and this is the way they made all these decisions to make themselves this way. I said, what about a, a granite mountain? It's an inanimate object. Where did it come from? We know it didn't create itself. Isn't that a testimony against that whole idea? They want to use the living creatures to talk about. What about the inanimate objects? The idea of the sand of the sea, the idea of the ocean, the idea of all the things that are around them, they don't want to know. They do not want to retain God in their knowledge. So inspiration has a process, and it begins with God giving it. It is the revelation. It goes from God to man. With inspiration, it goes from man to the paper. That's the process. And the proof is that we've got it in our hands. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. The Lord Jesus Christ really demonstrates in his ministry the importance of believing the word of God is the word of God. There is a serious commitment in Romans chapter 3 verse 1 when Paul says, What advantage, ha what advantage hath the Jew? He says, much in every way. Chiefly, he says, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Israel had a commitment to keep. And the Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with their lack of that commitment because while they did do a good job in preserving the Old Testament record, they also decided there were some things in it they didn't like and began to write other books that they began to live out of. And so you'll, you'll see him addressing those issues when he, instead of quoting the Old Testament, he'll say, you have heard by them of old. Or he'll mention that. And it's not in the Old Testament. And so what he's doing is he's quoting their book back to them. And then he's going to correct that book with the Word of God. We see it today. Whether it be the, whether it be the 
uh, Quran or whether it be the Book of Mormon or whether it be the, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. When people get together and they've got some doctrinal issues they want to disseminate around the world, they change their Bible. And if you want to try to talk about, we were just talking about soul sleep today with the, the two preachers out there in the hallway that are visiting here with that party last night. And, and I thought about that issue, and, you know, I didn't get into this with them, but I, I have been into this issue, and I can tell you this. You can't prove soul sleep <coughs> or annihilation with a King James Bible. You've got to leave it and go to the Knock Bible or other Bibles. They always have other Bibles, and God only wrote one Bible. And my, what a spotlight is it has become. It is the spotlight that shines on brightly on all the corrupted versions. If you want to know whether a Bible is the Word of God or not, just test it against your King James Bible. That's all you have to do. It's not that hard. Look at Matthew chapter 22. This is an easy issue. Look at verse uh, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? That's what he meant with their Old Testament. That's what he meant with their copies of the Word of God. You see, have you not read, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? He equates what the prophet spoke as the Word of God. He never questioned the word of God. He didn't cast doubt upon it. He never corrupted it. Turn to Matthew, or turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and look at verse 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself, notice what he says, for David himself said by the Holy Ghost. What is that? That's inspiration. Here he puts his stamp of approval on inspiration. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He, he quotes an Old Testament verse and demonstrates it to be inspired. Look at Luke chapter 1. This is all the way through your Bible, from one end of it to the other. It's, there's no, it doesn't, man, you have, to, you have to cut the verses out of a sermon like this. There's so many examples. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. He says, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying. There you have an instance right there where he prophesies right there in the book of Luke. And he's filled with the Holy Ghost, a demonstration of inspiration confirmed in your Bible. It really doesn't have to be proven. Galatians chapter 1. But since we're here studying about these things, then we should take the time to prove all things and look at them. Look at Galatians chapter 1. And look at verse 11. This is one of my favorite verses. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It went from the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul, it went from Paul to the paper, and it went from the paper to us in each successive generation. There is a way for you to participate. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. There is a way for you to participate in the process of preservation, and it's your responsibility as members of the body of Christ to be the preservation agency today in the dispensation of grace. Israel cannot do that anymore. She does not exist as a national entity today, and there is, uh, while she may exist as a national entity to the, in the news, as far as God's concerned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's no difference now. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You see, 
There you see a great example. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 15. <clears throat> Peter's talking about in explanation of what's happening now that the dispensation of grace is well underway and Israel's program is over temporarily, postponed. Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. It is salvation because what? The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, and that's when it started right there with with Paul. And Peter's recognizing it. He says, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. A guy asked me one time, well, where does Paul write to them guys? He writes private letters to them that are not the word of God. Okay. Now in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them things, in, in them of these things which are some, which some, are some things hard to be understood. Well, I imagine it would be hard to understand if you were... Peter didn't have any, any trouble understanding what was going on until uh, after he was rebuked. He was fine, wasn't he? He, he? he thought he understood it, and then he backed off on it. Well, that wasn't an understanding issue. That was a sin issue. And... And he understood it, but there are some things that must have been strange to them to, to see this program come so close and then not continue. They did not really get the fall of Israel, and it took them a while. But notice what he says. These things that are hard to understand, he says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. You can see the word wrestle there, twisting. As they do also the other scriptures. So they're what? They're taking Paul's verses in those things, he says, and he, they're, they're twisting them unto their own destruction. Peter calls Paul's writings here scriptures. And he includes them with his own personal correspondence, and it's probably true that the kingdom saints were also privy to Paul's epistles, even though they would have to learn that this is not directly to you. But it is going to concern you. And we see that happening and the changes that are happening pretty quickly down at Antioch when they begin to understand. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's hard for me to conceive that a person would believe the words on a page in a book and trust those words for their eternal life and then doubt the words that they just read. That's scary, isn't it? But they're taught to do it. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And look at verse 18. He says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. Um, that's not the verse I wanted. There's so many. Um, 1 Timothy 5. Yeah, that's it. For, no, that's not it. I'm sorry. Uh, go to Acts chapter 1. Many a slip between tongue and lip. Let's see. Acts chapter 1. When they're choosing Matthias, he says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Peter confirms David's prophecy. Look at chapter 3. You can see the same thing. In chapter 3, look at verse 21. Whom the heaven must, what? 
receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now turn to 2 Peter. This process, as you compare 2 Peter and 1 Peter, you see that, that he has quite a, bit of, quite a bit to say about this issue. And it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, when you look at it, you say, wow, this is not just something that he says. He quotes this. And he deals with these things as something that Israelites knew all along. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. And he's talking about the story of the transfiguration. And in verse 16, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. They heard it, they saw it, and then look at verse 19. Here's the more sure word. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do, dwell, you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. It is not written by men. It's written by God who uses men to dictate the words. It is about the words on the page. Inspiration is about the words that are written down. The word Scripture has to do with that which is written down. And God's purpose in all of this is to make his written word equal to himself. Because his word is equal to himself in every possible way. It's a real slap against his integrity and against his holiness to think he's going to say something that isn't true. What does Paul say in Titus 1? He said, God who cannot lie. I mean, he talks about that, and in Paul, he, it's, it's the promise of eternal life. In God who cannot lie, he cannot lie because Hebrews 6 says that it's impossible for him to lie. It's not in his nature. If you want to find out some of the things that God cannot do, that's one of them. He cannot act like you do. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. You see that? But holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the process of inspiration. Do you realize that the whole concept of prophecy in your Bible proves inspiration to be true? Think about that. If you want to talk about prophecy and look at all this, you say, well, I don't believe the New Testament. Some people say that. All the Jews say it. People say, I don't believe the New Testament. Hmm. So what happens when a person comes along and starts messing with the New Testament and they begin to corrupt it and they corrupt the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that are quoted from the Old Testament? Now what are they doing? They're contradicting themselves. They don't even know that David killed Goliath in the Old Testament because they don't know how to translate it. So, why would you want to trust modern Bible publishers with a new modern version to give you spiritual understanding when God in His Word says that spiritual understanding comes from you having the Holy Spirit and a book written by the Holy Spirit? We have to look at what the Bible says about itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says you can't understand the Bible spiritually because if you're unsaved because it's spiritually discerned. Well, how is it spiritually discerned if it's not perfect? If the Holy Spirit wrote it and it's not perfect, then we got a problem with the Holy Spirit now. Wow. I don't understand the concept. And 
the rejection of it is really not necessary. You can trust the authorized version. Look at chapter, look at Psalms chapter 6. There's been a lot of heat over this verse. And I'll talk about this. I read in a, a very ridiculous, dubious book about this issue called God's Word for Today. And he tried to put across the idea that when Moses broke the, the first set of tablets, the originals of the Ten Commandments, that when he got another set, he had another set of originals. Can you ever have another set of originals? I said this about four times yesterday to the man when he was talking to me about eternal security out in the lobby, and, he, and he, I said, if you lose eternal life, it wasn't eternal. That's not that hard to get. So now it's the same way. Look at verse 6, Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. You either believe it or you don't. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. If it's purified seven times, is there any dross in it? It's all been boiled to the top and scraped off. There is no dross in it. It's pure. He says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for how long? <laughs> turn to Psalm chapter 100. Turn to 119. This is the chapter you want to hang out in if you're having trouble with this issue because it's got 176 verses of nothing but it's verses about the Word of God. And uh, I picked a couple out for you. Verse 89 is good, but almost every verse in this chapter, I mean, it, it's just fantastic. Forever, O Lord, verse 89, 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. I remember going through this when, uh, when somebody was saying and teaching at the time, a very famous man who, who was dedicated to the promotion of Bible study, and he said, it's settled in heaven forever, and that's where it is. The problem is, it didn't stay there. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. Now, I just talked to you in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 with the, the key word there, being given. Take a look at this verse. Isaiah 55. Look at verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here's the integrity of God. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall, notice, not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It doesn't come back on God. He gave it, we have it, and that settles it. Now, finding it, that's, that's another issue, but it has to be done. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's talking about the very minutia parts of the Hebrew language that was necessary for them to get clarification on that. That's not even going to go away. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And you, you get this quoted early on in Isaiah, I believe, but it's it's fantastic verse, and it gives you great comfort when you begin to study the Bible and realize that, hey, you know what? This Bible, 
It's reading me. And as you read it and it reads you, it's a wonderful thing. Look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Now, we talk about Bible corruption, but we're talking about people who take the Bible and make corrupted versions of it. We're not talking about them being able to actually corrupt his word. They can revise it until the cows come home, but that doesn't matter because we have copies of it that have not been touched. So if you get one that's got a bad verse in it or something's missing or whatever, we had a brother come to one of the April meetings. He had just bought a brand new Bible, and uh, all the Bibles, all the books in the Old Testament, there was about six or eight books all out of order. Well, a brand new Bible, spent about 100 bucks on this thing, you know. And he gets to the Bible conference, and he's showing them how all the books are all messed up. Some of them were just, you just the collator went crazy, okay? That's what happened. And it happened to get through quality control. And he's looking at that, and, and it was real easy because he had a bunch of guys around him with the Bible saying, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. Here's the order. You're... He, was a, he was a Jehovah's Witness, and he was trying to get out of the New World Translation into the King James, and he goes down and buys one, and it has to be messed up. Well, it happens. Thank goodness if, if you get a Bible like that, you've got a whole bunch of friends, you just check theirs. You know, it's not corruptible. It's incorruptible by the word of God, which live and abideth forever. It liveth and abideth forever. And all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. He says, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. How are you going to study the word of truth if you don't have it? You can't. And God never asks you to do something you can't do. I mean, when people start talking about, I can't be holy. Well, why would he ask you to be holy if you can't be? Why, why would he do that? He, he doesn't put anything on you that, that he's not able to do through you. You know, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And he comes and he lives in us, see, so that he can dwell, right, so he saves us so that he can live in us and dwell in us, and then he can live his life through us. And that requires the word of God. You can't do it without the word of God. It's, in, it's unfathomable to me that, that he, anybody would even think that way. I don't know why God would inspire his Bible. I don't know why he would do that without any idea of preserving it. So people today could say, well, hmm, it lost something in the translation. No, my friend, you're the one that's lost. You're either unlearned or unsaved, one of the two. So what you need to do is take a look at this verse. Turn to John chapter 12. This is pretty important because as we said well ago, the word of God plays a big role in everything. By God's word, he spoke the worlds into existence. Look at John chapter 12. And notice the plural. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Turn over to, uh, here's a great confirmation of Paul's message. Turn to Romans chapter 2 and look at verse 16. Paul says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, and he's going to use his words according to my gospel. The principles set forth in Romans 1 to 8 are going to be utilized in the judgment of all mankind. You see, God is going to use his words, and when it comes down to his words, here's what Paul says, Romans 3, 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Romans 3, 3. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, notice, here's how God's going to be vindicated at the great white throne that thou mightest just be justified in thy sayings 
and mightest overcome when thou art judged. You, you see, remember over there in Matthew 25 where they say, when didn't we do that? When didn't we help you? When didn't we come and visit you? They start trying to get out of it. You know what God's going to do? Just like he's going to do when he judges the nations, he's going to do it at the great white throne. He's going to do it with all lost people. The words are going to take care of them. That's why he says, and the books were opened. And another book was opened. And if he takes this book and puts it against your books, which are the list of everything you ever did wrong against him, I don't think you're going to come out too well in that. The integrity of God, the holiness, his promises, rest in the idea that God has preserved his word. Your eternal life depends on it. The veracity of God's own words, the truthfulness of it, the fullness, that plenary authority, that full, complete, entire authority has been preserved for you to read over and over and over and over, and it doesn't matter what kind of day I have. Romans chapter 5 is still there when I need it. Romans chapter 8 is still there when I need it, okay? It doesn't change. Let's close with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, my pastor gave me a, a lady in his church. Bless her heart, she was the sweetest thing. And she had taken these, she went to Sears Roebuck, 1 first, first Thessalonians 2, <clears throat> verse 13. She went to Sears Roebuck, and she would buy these cabinet doors from their kitchen department that had been dinged up or slightly imperf had imperfections. And she would take those things home, and she would paint on them Bible verses. And they were the most beautiful things. I mean, she had a bird sitting on a branch, and then she'd have a verse on that. And it's a beautiful cherry doors and maple doors she would get. And she would hand paint in, in Times Roman type, beautifully done. And I would walk through his home, and I'd say, look, these are so cool. And he would explain to me, he was explaining to me how this all happened and how she was doing this. And later on, uh, it, was, it was interesting because he gave me this verse. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It's painted on a, a maple door. It's the first thing you see when you walk into my house. Verse 13, he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. They not only believed the word of God as it was spoken, but they believed it as it is in truth, what? The word of God. And then he says, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That's the purpose of him preserving it, and that's the, the power of him preserving it, and that's the great pleasure you have of him having preserved it, is that you've got the word of God living in you. The world thinks this is peculiar. He told me, Russ, the world thinks we're crazy, but we know they are. <laughs> if you believe the Bible's in the Pope's basement, and that's where it resides, or you think that spiritual comprehension comes from using modern language with several thousand verses missing, I got news for you. God's word is intact, it's working, it's still working, and it's going to continue to work because he preserved it for us. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word again, and thank you for giving us your word. We thank you that... Uh, the Bible issue, while it is sometimes confusing for many people, it's really not that hard of a thing to grasp, that we have a Bible, and we believe it, we understand it, and we, we love it, Lord, because the entrance of thy word giveth us the truth, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to open a book and just know it's you speaking to us. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.